great turnout. It's really a, a delight and a pleasure to uh, invite uh, Professor Jenny Penberthy here to talk about our own uh, Lorene Niedeker. Uh, Penberthy is visiting us from Capilano University in Vancouver. Though I found out last night that she considers uh, Wisconsin to be like a second home. She's done so much research here. She even follows our politics. <laughs> she needs a little black humor in, <laughs> in her life. So, um, uh, Jenny Penberthy has probably done more than any other human being to, to sort of let the light shine on the work of uh, uh, Lorene Niedeker. Um, and by the way, I've asked, some of you know quite a lot about Lorene Niedeker, or Lorene as we call her, and some, some of you not so much. So I've asked her to give a little, uh, just a little history, because uh, she's more interesting to listen to than I am. Um, uh, Niedeker was increasingly well known during her lifetime, uh, but she, and she died at the height of her powers at age 67 in 1970. And at that time, she had only published two volumes of poetry, and the rest of her poetry was uncollected in little journals uh, and magazines around the country. So uh, when Penberthy's Lorene Niedeker Collected Works appeared from the University of California in 2003, it was a watershed moment for Niedeker studies and indeed for all of modern poetry. The collected works not only included all of Niedeker's poems, it also comprised plays and other sketches. And we use this text. Any FYI students here from last year? Yeah, there they are in the back. We used this text uh, in my seminar, FYI seminar, last year called In Search of the Poets, so they know it well. Um, so this was the first time that uh, lovers of Lorene Niedeker's poetry get it, could get their hands on all of her work in one volume, which is really important for readers and for scholars and helped sort of, uh, uh, I think, start a renaissance in uh, Niedeker's studies. Um, writing in The Guardian, David Wheatley extolled of her work as follows. Jenny, Pemberthy, Jenny Pemberthy's exhaustive labors have transformed the way we, we read Niedeker. So today's talk is an extraordinary confluence. We have Wisconsin's greatest poet and her greatest scholarly advocate, meeting at Beloit, the great college, uh, where Niedeker came, uh, came of age as a student and a young writer. And I want to thank Fred Burwell for bringing great stuff from our archives here. We have a report card uh, from uh, Lorene Niedeker in 1922. You can see what grades she got in botany. Uh, we have some other stuff. We have a yearbook here with uh, um, signed passages and uh, other early works and chapbooks. So feel free to come and check these out afterwards and to touch them and, and stay afterwards to ask questions and mingle. Um, today's talk brings together other notable advocates of uh, Lorene, uh, Lorene Niedeker from Fort Atkinson, members of the Friends of Lorene Niedeker are here. And um, also we have uh, from Milwaukee, Carl Gartung and Ann Kingsbury from uh, the Great Woodland Pattern a Bookstore, one of the great uh, independent book centers in the world. So, um, and by the way, the Friends of Lorene Niedeker helped sponsor this visit, so we're thankful for that. And uh, so, one of the things that's happening is tomorrow, uh, Jenny and Carl are leaving on a pilgrimage, and they're going around uh, Lake Superior by car. Oh, yeah, yeah, also. <laughs> and, um, and another poet also, uh, Chuck Stelton. And they're uh, taking a trip around Lake Superior that uh, Lorene Niedeker took, I believe, in 1965. Uh, this was a big journey for her, and she came uh, from that trip spurred some of her great uh, poems, uh, Lake Superior in particular. Um, so they're leaving on that uh, uh, journey tomorrow. And this talk comes at a time when Beloit College is strengthening our ties with Niedeker. The college has been working with the Friends Group to make uh, Beloit the academic home of Lorene Niedeker, uh, which seems right and proper since she was uh, one of our own alums. And a part of this partnership includes the naming of the English Department's Visiting Writers Series, um, which is part of this event. So stay tuned for that. So, as they say at literary events, without further ado, please give up Jenny Penderby a warm welcome. <laughs> After the talk, we'll have just a few questions and then we can move on to uh, the lobby. Thank you so much, Chris and Beloit College for bringing you here, and um, also to the friends of Warren Niedecker and Paul Atkinson. Um, thanks also to Carl Gartan for his work in uh, setting up this visit. 
So I, I understand that there are a variety of familiarities with uh, Lorene Niedecker in this audience. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to, at, at Chris's request, uh, go over a few details of her life for those of you who don't know those already. Um, she was born in 1903 in Fort Atkinson and lived most of her life on Blackhawk Island, enduring uh, the floods, um, seasonal floods, and it's fascinating to me to see the Rock River uh, flowing so, um, so briskly right now. And in fact, um, when, I, when Carl took me onto Blackhawk Island a few days ago, um, the road was still passable, but Niedecker's property um, was, was flooded. Um, yeah, so she um, lived in, in varied circumstances on the island. The, the, um, she lived her, her youth um, in fairly comfortable circumstances. Her mother's family um, owned much of property on, on the island, and gradually um, the family became more impoverished. and. Um, by the mid-40s, Nida had moved into the single-broomed cabin that you can now see on, on Blackhawk Island and uh, lived there for 20 years before moving into a slightly more, um, only slightly more roomy <laughs> cottage on the same property. She also lived a few years in Milwaukee. Um, yeah, so between the years of 1922 and 1924, she attended Beloit College um, and was, was forced to leave um, before graduating for family reasons that we don't quite know um, the precise details of. Um, following that, she, she had various jobs. One of them was a library assistant um, at Fort Atkinson, um, Dwight Foster Public Library. Um, that was probably the, the better of the jobs that she held um, from, uh, in, during her lifetime. But uh, throughout that lifetime, she was a very committed poet. Um, in her late 20s, she made contact with a New, a New York poet, Louis Zukowski, and he introduced her to many new developments in, in poetry, and also to many poets um, across um, um, metropolitan um, United States and across uh, across the world, for that matter. Um, yeah, so that maybe is enough uh, enough introductory detail for for Hideko, and um, I'll, I'll go from there to to my comments. Um, since I began working on Niedecker's writing as a, as a grad student in the 1980s, Beloit College has uh, had an important resonance for me um, as Niedecker's alma mater and, of course, it's much referenced in, in Niedecker's studies. Uh, the name has posed a bit of a mystery. Um, a French name, it would seem, Belois, anglicized to Beloit, and reading around the internet, I hear that the name is something of a hybrid of the French word belle for beautiful and de toi, uh, the French word for straits or narrows, better known as Detroit. Um, so uh, this would be familiar history to, to you, but it strikes me as highly suitable that Niedecker should have been drawn to Beloit a city with a name of its own coinage. Um, ten years later, after leaving, after leaving Beloit, she would engage in similar new coinages as, as a poet and as a self-made surrealist. It also feels appropriate to be gathering in the World Affairs Centre here at Beloit College. Um, I gave this talk the title of In the Field in Niedecke Country, um, acknowledging my return to Niedecke Country. My, this is my fourth trip to Wisconsin and to Fort Atkinson and Black Hawk Island. Um, but I also have a, a, a kind of um, teasing sense in, in the title of the very wide parameters of Niedecke Country. Um, we know that she was published and read in many corners of the globe. 
and that her writings refer to the history, politics, geography, and literature of um, many corners of the globe, in as much as one can talk of corners of something circular. Um, we know well her comment of what region, her question, what region, when her book TNG was shelved with regional writing by the UW Madison Library. In the field, in need of a country, the field needs some attention too. Um, there is the ground of Wisconsin, which I'm happy to have returned to. And I must say, um, returning uh, to Black Hawk Island and going around that corner and seeing the cabin again for the fourth time, I was just astounded all over again by the size of it. Um, to, to think of her living um, contentedly in this tiny, tiny cabin with, uh, with no plumbing um, through these, these harsh winters. And, it's, um, and, and she, by, by all accounts, loved it, um, chose it. Um, fascinating. Um, the, uh, the archives in Fort Atkinson and here in, in Beloit have, um, have so much to offer a researcher into Nidika's writing. So, in the field, um, and then of course tomorrow, as Chris said, we'll be setting off on the, um, on the trip around Lake Superior. Uh, definitely a field trip. Um, but Nidaka's field was also a lot more to her uh, than her home base and home geography. Books were her field and the source of her field work. Books were her world, uh, a world of print. And um, very, very usefully, importantly for Nidaka's studies, um, the book collections in Fort Atkinson uh, both at the library and at um, the Horde Museum are, um, are available, um, hugely useful to have access to Nedeka's own book collection. And those books are, um, the inventories are available online and, and uh, yeah, they're a hugely important source for, for scholars. Um, so included in that, um, that world of print were, were her letters to friends and, and poets and editors. And probing that world requires a huge amount of detective work. There's so little documentation out there. Uh, we all regret Al Millen's fidelity to his wife's instructions to destroy her papers. We understand that that Al was being the loyal spouse. Nevertheless, we feel the regret. <laughs> I was just reading the other day a review of a new translation of Franz Kafka, and um, he, of course, left instructions for his friend Max Brod to destroy all of his unfinished manuscripts, um, and that would be the novels we know, The Trial, The Castle, and America. But Max Brod actually disobeyed the instructions, <laughs> so it has happened. Um, but it was not, you know, we, we, we can't pin this all on Al. Um, Nidaka and Zukovsky together destroyed many of the letters that she um, uh, wrote to him in the, in the first decade and a half of their friendship. And then subsequently she trimmed his voluminous letters to her. So my point is that we have very little to work with as we reconstruct her, her life and writing. Um, there were no interviews with her. Um, where was the Paris Review? They, they uh, began their remarkable interview series, Writers at Work, in 1953. They published her poems but they, they didn't ever interview her. Um, the other great loss is, the, is when Sid Corman visited her late in 1970, shortly before she died, 
um, he did the wonderful thing of recording her reading from uh, the harpsichord and salt fish. She read the entire manuscript. Um, and then, and this was being recorded on a, on a cassette um, player. And, and then he began an interview, and he asks her uh, one opening question, and her reply to it, I forget now the, the question, the reply is, I think lines of poetry that I might use all day long, and even in the night. And at that point, the tape ends. Mm. And being a cassette tape, one can remove it and turn it over, right? <laughs> However, oh, forgive me, Sid, but <laughs> on the other side was a recording of Sid reading his own poetry. <laughs> and so Sid chose to preserve his own recording. <laughs> And we have countless, countless hours of recording of Sid reading his <laughs> So that particular 45 minutes did not need to be preserved. Anyway, um, we instead have to do the hard work ourselves to try to find uh, more information about her, her work. Uh, we, we, we locate her letters to others, we read the poems carefully to try to understand um, the writing. Um, and the writing, of course, is notoriously resistant to the standard methods of interpretation. Um, so we can study the period, study the poets she read and, and the poets she was informed by. Um, the magazines she favoured, the books she collected, the books she borrowed from libraries. All of this contains really um, important information. But truly transformative in this process of tracking materials has been the digitising of inventories of, of archives. Um, and in some cases, the digitising of the archives themselves. Um, and Fort Atkinson um, has done a superb job of, of, um, of, of digitizing their collections. Um, studying Nilaka's writing in this new digital environment offers so much, and I strongly encourage any young scholars here today to get to work. There's so much more work to be done, so much more that um, can be uncovered about her writing. Um, for instance, very little has been done yet on the, her relationship to the poets she read um, and the poets she admired. Um, what impact, for instance, did her very close reading of Charles Olson have on her, her longer poem, Lake Superior? Um, she had several of his books in her, in her collection, and we also know from her letters to Sid Corman that she read Olson um, in Origin magazine, starting in the, in the late 50s. Um, one of the questions that we have with the book collection, um, we, have a, we have an inventory of it which is uh, online and very useful because it dates the, um, the editions that she owned. Um, but one of the things we don't know is when she acquired these books, which, um, you know, in this particular field, and you'll see as I go on just quite how relevant these books are to the production of, of her writing. Um, it is important to know when, when the books um, entered her, her, um, her sphere. And so again, that's something that um, it will just take a bit of legwork um, to, to arrive at, you know going through all the existing letters and tracing where she refers to these books. And so a little annotation in that book list. This book was published in 1927, but she only acquired it in 1957. You know, this makes, this makes a difference. Um, so, you know, scrolling around the web, I keep running into little surprises. Like, what do we make of the fact that the... Um, 
the August 1963 issue of Poetry Magazine published Niedecker <coughs> along, alongside Sylvia Plath. You know, nobody would dream of talking about Niedecker and Plath in the same sentence, right? But there they were in 1963, published side by side, um, which would mean that each, uh, well, no, would mean that Niedecker certainly read Plath. Plath died very soon after that publication. Um, yeah, and you know, the other thing is to read through magazines such as Origin, and uh, which she gave very, very close attention to. Uh, she was a subscriber. Um, and the magazines came in from Japan for her on a regular basis. And she read the French poets there, France, Francis Pange and, and others who, who made a big impact on her writing. So again, there's very, very little that has yet been done about her, her reading. I have a project. Um, you know, I've really, I've been writing about Nida and thinking about her for um, decades. And um, I keep sort of testing my pulse and thinking, you know, like, you know is this, <laughs> do I really want to do this? But um, do I want to keep doing this? But actually, I'm just, I'm still thoroughly engaged by her writing. I find it so deeply interesting. So anyway, I am still at it. And I'm working now on a collection of um, selected letters, previously unpublished letters, and there are a great many of them that I've been uncovering, um, largely with the help of, of the internet. Um, so all kinds of little odds, of, odds and ends are, are turning up, and here's an accidental find. Um, I, I found two Niedeke letters in the inventory for the Beinecke Library, and um, in, the, in a folder for the editor of Beaux-Arts Westminster magazine, um, which published Niedecker in 1935. So two letters to the editor. And I, I wrote to the library and asked if I could see copies of those. And they wrote back and said, well, um, two copies would cost me the same as 10 copies. So I went back to the inventory and said, well, yeah, OK, I'll also have the Louis Zukowski letters to the editor. So I got those and was completely delighted that uh, this accident had occurred. And I'll, I'll read you um, some excerpts from, from these letters of his. He was, he was um, the editor was unknown to Nidaka, but um, clearly uh, something of a, an acquaintance for Zukowski. I suggest you get in touch with Kenneth Rexroth, also Lorene Niedecker, Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, the only woman in the USA, as far as I know, now writing poetry, <laughs> with, the, with the exception of Marion Wern, and promising more of a base to build on than Marion. I suggest you take something by her whether you like it or not. <laughs> or whether Ezra Pound likes it or not. <laughs> Such exceptions should be made sometimes, so as not to risk dogma. In any case, she is working out in Fort Atkinson all alone without help from anybody, what the Surrealists are doing as a group in Europe. Again, not a matter of influence but of similar events happening in different places at the same time, because the age is a base. You will find texture in Laurie Niedecke, if not perfect poems. That is, you will probably not find poems as we would like them. I consider it a grave error not to have included her in the Objectivists' anthology. And then, uh, a few months later, I'm asking Lorene Niedecker to send you her latest, a play in two pages. I think that would be the best piece for, by her for your purpose. Fine lyricism and sincerity, and realization of the characters and the words they speak, which Gertrude Stein's Three Saints, for example, falls short of. And then, finally, um, I'd appreciate proof copies, so would Lorene Niedecker. I'm elated that you have decided to print her. 
So yeah, really <laughs> delightful little little extra there. Um, we often think of Zukovsky as placing obstacles in her path uh, or imposing his own aesthetic requirements. Um, but these letters are a vigorous endorsement of her independent style. Um, and they also reveal Zukovsky's strenuous efforts to see her published. Another exciting discovery for my project was the name of the library that appears to have Niedecker's letters to Ian Hamilton Finley, uh, her publisher um, at the Wild Hawthorne Press in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, these would be the letters that she wrote to him in the course of seeing the book My Friend Tree into print in, in 1962. Um, in the 1980s, I visited Finlay at his home in Scotland, and among other things, I asked him if he still had Niedecker's letters. He looked up at the ceiling and said, they would be in the attic. And by now, the rats will have got them. <laughs> so I gave up hope of ever seeing those. Um, but then I found an online inventory for a collection in a university library in New York State. And I've been in touch with them for a year now, and I still haven't seen the letters. The library has budget problems, and they no longer have a special collections librarian. I offered to visit the library in person, um, but I was told that no librarian would know where to find the letters. Um, the head librarian hoped the situation would change in six months' time, and I should contact her then, which I did last month. And things have deteriorated further in the library. However, I, I made a pretty, pretty passionate um, plea, and she's going to try to find a student who will scan the letters um, on my behalf and uh, I will I'll need to fund the student for this activity. So this, this might actually happen next month. <laughs> anyway, they will form a centerpiece, I'm sure, once I um, have access to them in this collection. Um, now, as part of this process of searching for new letters, I decided to return to the collections that I'm already familiar with. Um, I wrote to special collections at the University of Chicago Library to ask them to send me the Niedeker letters to Harriet Monroe, editor of Poetry Magazine. And these letters are printed in um, Laurie Niedeker, Woman and Poet, which was published in the um, mid-90s. Um, so they, they duly sent me the letters, and as I looked through them, I found that there was one page that they hadn't sent me in the 1990s when I wrote on that book. And um, here I have a slide of the, of the, of the page. Um, how much of that you can see. Um, it says, um, yeah, this is an actual letter. So January 14th, 1932, um, in accordance, so the second paragraph, in accordance with your inquiry for brief autobiography, Doreen Niedecker, Mrs. Frank Hartwig, aged 28, born near Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, and now living there, has been published in Parnassus, Interludes, Will of the Wisp, Northern Light, and Kaleidoscope. Now, we, we know about uh, two of those poems, um, those published in Will of the Wisp and Parnassus. Those, those two are in the collected works, um, and they're, they're listed as the first two poems in the, in the collected works. Um, I'll quickly read them to remind, or for those of you who aren't familiar. Colours, a transition. Colours of October wait with easy dignity for the big change, like gorgeous quill pens in old inkwells almost dry. And then Morning Dove, both of them published in 28. Not that long after she left the light. 
Morning Dove. The sound of a morning dove slows the dawn. There is a deep, round silence in the sound. Or it may be I face the dull prospect of an imagist turned philosopher. Um, yeah, so uh, there are, so we learn, three more magazines that we weren't aware of previously. Interludes, Northern Light, and Kaleidoscope. And I set about finding copies of those. Um, unsurprisingly, copies are very rare. But the wonderful New York Public Library has all three of the magazines. And I paid a library assistant to search through them, looking for the Nilo poems. Two poems came to light, uh, one from Interludes, one from Kaleidoscope. Um, I've got some not great images here. That is the, that's the cover of Interludes, a magazine of verse. This is the issue that published her. Um, table of contents. Um, there she is, Caprice, page 94. And there's the poem, quite strikingly different from the poems around it. Um, have I got a better version of this? I think I do. Yeah, there it is. Um, Caprice. This day comes as impermanent as a saffron butterfly surfacing cornflowers. Uncertain clocks play with time, and thoughts fall no more potently than dolls collapsing. We're heading into difficult knee -dacre. <laughs> She She didn't take long to, um, to move into this um, much more challenging terrain. And of course, what's so interesting here is that we're seeing poems um, that we can describe as pre-contact, um, pre-Louis <laughs> pre Zukowski. Um, and these were poems she was writing, she was writing very much on her, on her own, um, in living on Black Hawk Island, and uh, at this point, working in the Fred Atkinson Library. And yeah, here is the cover of Kaleidoscope. And this tiny little poem wedged in at the, at the bottom there. Um, oh yeah, and, and I'll, I'll read the poem in a second, but um, this is kind of interesting, the, the bio, bio note here. The Rini Rego Ford Atkins of Wisconsin has been published in Interludes, Will of the Wisp, Northern Light, and Parnassus. So at this point, she has published in the other four magazines. Okay. Um, so, benefit for the poor. The streets give a play for the windows. People pass all day. For those not seeing speckled fish any other way. I think I read that badly there. So, the streets give a play for the windows. People pass all day. For those not seeing speckled fish any other way. I'm thinking that this is a, is, you know, sort of bracketed. Yeah. <laughs> that is a tough poem. Um, yes. So, um, The Northern Light was the, uh, the third of these magazines, and this one has proved um, more difficult. Uh, the, the magazine began in January 27, ran um, through till 1932, in between it changed its name to Western Poetry. So from December 1929 to October 1930, it had another name, then it reverted to um, Northern Light. I was told by the New York Public Library that 
quote, the material is in horrible condition and is partially mutilated to the point where pages are loose and missing sections of pages. Some pages have no page numbers, so also there is no way to know if we are missing pages. They failed to locate the contribution by Niedecker. I then turned to the Minnesota Historical Society that has a microfilmed copy of the complete run of the magazine, and they were willing to send it to me by interlibrary loan. I looked through the microfilmed pages twice. Um, it's a long, it, it published very, very regularly. There are hundreds of pages, and I went very carefully through them twice, and I couldn't find the, the poem. However, it's very hard to accept that this poem is missing because she's referred to it in two bio notes. Um, I, I made PDF copies of every page of the magazine and they are sitting on my computer waiting for another long search, which I haven't, I haven't done yet. But I'm hopeful that before too long there will be a third <laughs> new poem. So yeah, we have, um, we have at least two new poems, new to her current readers, that is, and um, they're an important addition to the very small amount of information that we have about her early years as, as a writer. Um, she wrote these very, uh, just a few years after leaving Beloit. Um, we know from archival evidence here at Beloit that in 1923 Nedeka had two poems titled Koshkanong and Fever, and uh, both of those she read at an occasion at Beloit, um, but we don't know what happened to, to those. Um, before those, we have two yearbook poems from her high school days. Um, yeah, so very interesting to read the newly discovered poems, early poems, with a um, a sense of the developing voice that we're familiar with. Um, also interesting to see that both Caprice and Benefit for the Poor uh, have similarities to the poems that she published in Poetry Magazine in 1933. Um, so she's definitely already beginning to work with something of a surrealist mode, um, very much her own, of her own making. Why did she choose those particular magazines? Did she always submit only one poem for publication? What did the accompanying letters to the editors say? What correspondence took place between her and the editors? All of these are detective uh, projects waiting for researchers. It's entirely possible that the editors of these magazines have their personal archives um, in libraries somewhere on the continent. Um, another, uh, another task that um, I, I believe would yield uh, very important information is a study of poetry magazine in the 20s and 30s. Um, I think we would find there a lot, of, um, a lot of information about the context for her writing. Um, influences and and also, there's a news notes section at the back of Poetry Magazine where um, new magazines are, are referred to and recommended. There's, in January 1928, the news notes um, section says, Mr. B.C. Hagland, editor of The Northern Light at Holt, Minnesota, has been carrying on an editorial battle with Mr. Noah F. Whitaker of Pegasus on behalf of Carl Sandburg and other writers of the new poetry. And it seems to me entirely possible that Nidoka would have seen something like that and then wanted to submit her new poetry to, to Northern Light. Um, interesting also that uh, in 1923, here at Beloit College, um, Nidoka heard Harriet Monroe, editor of Poetry Magazine, give a lecture, um, and the Beloit Roundtable that I was looking at this morning um, has an article 
following the lecture that uh, sum, sums up the, the content of, of that talk. And uh, there are a few things I'd like to um, read to you from that, uh, that article. Um, okay. All we are, this is a quote from Munro. All we ask is that the poet be allowed to use the form of verse which best fits the thought he is trying to express. Um, and then Monroe spoke of the work of some of the leaders in modern verse and read selections from their poems. Um, and then another com a comment, uh, this is a quote from Monroe, um, since the first noticeable, sorry, it's not that easy to read, um, since the first notice, noticeable breaks from the old style by Shelley, Coleridge and Byron, the poetic field has been constantly moved by a series of renaissances. And Miss Munro styled Walt Whitman as a pioneer of free verse who developed his mode of expression in spite of the criticism of contemporaries. Quote, poetry expresses the mood of the age in which it is written. And the modern era requires a distinctly different mode of expression than the heavy meter of the Victorians. So those are some um, comments made by, by Harriet Munro that would surely have appealed to, to Niedecker. Um, and... Uh, uh, very likely encouraged her, both in her reading of Poetry Magazine, but also um, to, um, to submit poems, which she eventually did in, in the early 30s. Well, the first submission was 1931. Um, yeah, so I, I want to move on to uh, talk about, um, talk in more detail about a, a poet who Niedecke read very closely and who was an important um, influence, I would argue, on, on her work. And this is Emily Dickinson. Um, she introduced Zukovsky to Dickinson's poetry. Um, and there, she has quite a number of Dickinson books in, in her, her library. Um, however, many of them are, are acquired uh, a, a lot later than, than um, she would have first read them. But here is the letter that uh, Zukovsky writes to her in 1945. Um, I got Emily, whom I'll keep, and you can have it whenever you want it, though. The two of them exchanged books um, a lot, shared books, and mailed them to and fro. I've had about an hour to turn pages. I've looked through those you copied out. They're not up to the two in Test of Poetry, I think but I see what you like. She's really a lot of source material for modern guys, even Bill Williams. For example, the red man and the yellow man, though he probably doesn't know it. She is very rarely perfect, but what's good about her, even when she's bad, is that she's always writing intensely. You can feel it, even if the poems result in almost no intensity or fall deaden. What pleases me most in how she follows things is in, in the sounds is, is the sounds she works on, so that the sounds track or trace the things and states of things. It'll take a long time before I can go through the book, however. Um, yeah, so I've, I've um, just once used Dickinson and Niedecker in the classroom, and I thought I would... Um, just run you, uh, show you some of the, the comments that I've collected up. Um, let's see. Maybe I'll uh, oh, that was easier than I expected. <laughs> um, okay, so Nidoko's yeah, often compared to Dickinson in the 30s, in the 30s and 40s. Um, it was Tchaikovsky who did this, typically, but also uh, William Collins Williams did the same. Um, several times Tchaikovsky talked about her as the Emily of our day. 
Um, and here again, Mrs. Zukowski um, just came back from Mark Van Doren's, told him that both Marion and Bill had praised your work and that I thought you the Emily of our age or rage. Mm -hmm. um, Zukowski, when he compiled the anthology called The Test of Poetry, um, and initially had three uh, Dickinson poems. And then, because of the permissions fees, he, he withdrew them um, and said that, in, in, that there was enough Emily Dickinson in Niederker's Hairshine, which is the poem, There's a Better Shine. Right? There's a better shine on the pendulum than is on my hair. And many times I've seen it there. Um, one of my students did the the brilliant thing of entering the word pendulum into the Dickinson online um, uh, search. Uh, I've got the page, I'll show it to you. Um, it's, it's a, some of you may have used it. It's a pretty remarkable thing where you just, uh, you can search an individual word and it'll bring up all the manuscripts, all the Dickinson manuscripts that use that, that word. And I was astounded to find that there are three Dickinson poems that have the pendulum right at the heart of them. Um, and I think it's no... And so Zukowski knew what he was referring to here when um, he said there was Dickinson in her, her pendulum poem. Um, oh yeah, so these are the books in the, in, um, the library. She also had a, a, a very special cupboard that she kept her most prized books in. And she, she did this largely um, in the interest of, of quick evacuation. Um, she would, if she had to evacuate fast, she would take the immortal cupboard <laughs> and leave the rest of the books behind. But um, there you see I've, I've, I've highlighted the dates. You know, she quite possibly had the, the Genevieve Taggart book early, um, but the rest of them are all quite late, and it's most likely that she would have read, uh, read Dickinson um, very early, and uh, the, the Dickinson's several publications would have, been, would have been reviewed in Poetry Magazine, and she would have had access to them through her library, through the local library, the kinds of books that would be collected. Um, yes, so here she is writing to Gail Rubb. Oh, no, that's can't be Gail, it's 1960. Oh, it's, uh, I think she's writing to Sid Corman. At 57, I have two people, Emily Dickinson and Lou Zukowski, after a lifetime, almost, of reading. And I'd like just now the few poems I know to be the best. Oh, for a book of, uh, of her work that Sid Corman is proposing. Those that carry a load of ecstasy. Been reading Dickinson and about her. Here are two, um, two comments that she pulled out of Charles Anderson's book on, on Dickinson, and I think they're highly relevant for um, her, own, her own writing. Dickinson's poetry came out of language. language the inspiration and creator. If the creative writer pushes far enough into language, he finds himself in the embrace of thought. And these are her Dickinson notes for Gail Raab. She did a great deal of note-taking for her friends. Um, she quotes Dickinson here, talking about someone dull. He has the facts, but not the phosphorescence of learning. <laughs> If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. And, you know, I would argue that, uh, that Nina is aiming at, at something quite similar to this. Um, her, her techniques are, of course, different.
Okay, so I've just lined up a few um, instances of echoes of um, Dickinson and Niedecker's work here. So, um, you know, the classic Dickinson line, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. And Niedecker, in days when thought arose and kindly stayed, you know, it's just got that sort of bare echo of, of Dickinson there. Here um, we have Dickinson, while asters on the hill their everlasting fashions set and covenant gentians frill. And my coat red bear over and down Capitol Hill fashions morning after. This one, um, okay, the Dickinson, uh, this is, this would have been the version that Nieleka very likely um, read. Um, the poem titled by Dickinson's editors, The Wife. She rose to his requirement, dropped the playthings of her life to take the honorable work of woman and of wife. If aught she missed in her new day of amplitude or awe, or first perspective or the gold in using wore away, it lay unmentioned as the sea develops pearl and weed but only to himself is known the fathoms they abide. And then we get Niedecker's um, poem about marriage. I rose from marsh, mud, algae, equisetum, willows, sweet, green, noisy birds and frogs, to see her wed in the rich, rich silence of the church, the little white slave girl in her diamond fronds. In aisle and arch, satin secret collects, united for life to serve silver, possessed. Quite a relationship there. Oh yeah, this one I just found the other day. Um, spring, spring comes on the world, I cite the Aprils, and I'll just read that about. How white the gulls in grey weather, soon April the little yellows. This, the Aprils and yellows kind of struck a chord for me. Oh uh, yeah, okay. This is the, um, that's the, the search uh, tool for the, um, the Dickinson editions. The Dickinson manuscript, essentially. Um, right, I'm going to just try and speed along. I seem to be going on forever here. Um, just to refer back to Nidaka and her kind of global reach, um, I've been in the last uh, year in correspondence with a Spanish um, scholar and translator who has been translating Nidaka. She's now published a very large collection of um, of translations, um, the Spanish on one side of the page and, and you know, opposite of the, uh, the English. And um, we've had many fascinating conversations. One of the great problems for a translation into Spanish is that there is no dash in, in Spanish. And so Niloca's poems are just crammed with dashes. And I'm not sure at all what, what happens when one translates Dickinson into Spanish. <laughs> um, anyway, one of the. Uh, let me get rid of this. Uh, how do I get rid of this? Any suggestions for how I close this? Well, I'm not a Nat user. Oh, there. This is surely what I need. Oh, maybe I don't want to close this one. one of the poems that we were talking about, Linnaeus and Lapland, um, Linnaeus being the botanist and um, uh, the great 
famous um, creator of the, of the taxonomy uh, classific classification of, speech, of species. Um, so there you have the, the English and the, um, and the Spanish. Now, one of the things that happened for me when I was um, working with her on this, on this poem was I, okay, let me read it. Um, Linnaeus in Lapland. Nothing worth noting except an Andromeda with quadrangular shoots. The boots of the people wet inside. They must swim to church through the floods or be taxed. The blossoms from the bosoms of the leaves. Um, so on either side, you have the, the scientific observation and then the, the local um, observation of lo lives of local people um, in the middle. And I, I thought, oh, I'll just drop that into Google and see if I actually find the, um, the original uh, Linnaeus. And of course, yeah. remarkably, the um, journals, Linnaeus journals through Lapland are all digitized and it didn't take me very long at all to find the, the sources. particularly worth noticing, by the way, except an Andromeda with quadrangular shoots and flowers from the bosoms of the leaves. Um, so there it is, it's practically a word-for-word -word quote from, from the uh, journal. And likewise, take my word for it, that uh, the boots of the people wet inside, they must swim to church through the floods or be taxed. That, in fact, is a, is a paraphrase um, of, of the wording here that refers to the practice of, um, of taxing the, the Laplanders who don't go to church. Um, and, you know, if the poem is full of so, so you know, here you have really a poem that's derived entirely out of the words of, of Linnaeus, right? And this is true of so many of Nilo's poems. And you know, what what sense do we make of this? How do we how do we even begin to engage with these poems, right? They they they're they're such a resistant surface. Um, but she's doing all kinds of playful things. Um, she's the taxed, the people who are being taxed, of course, this is the great taxonomer, right, who's uh, doing his own um, version of taxing. Um, and, and this, of course, posed problems for the translator because she wanted to both communicate the sense of something punitive in, in, in the taxation, but also the sense of um, the, the classification and recording, and the Spanish won't do that. Um, so she had to, had to choose um, one, one uh, over the other, and so she chose the, the classification, as you can see in classificados. Anyway, a fascinating correspondence, and that led me just, you know, by chance, to, to look this up online, and there it is. We can be doing this now with, with all of Nilaka's poems. You know, instead of wrestling with these things and saying, you know, what, what on earth was she, was she doing? Um, there are the answers. And I'll give you just one more example of this. Uh, sorry, I should be doing a nicer version of this, but anyway. Um, a very curious poem. <laughs> May you have lumps in your mashed potatoes, Henry and William cried, 
to those who stood up to them in argument 